Well, good morning, church. My name's John. I'm one of the pastors here. Ooh, I'm, maybe I need to stand back here. I'm one of the pastors here, and it is just such an honor to worship Jesus with you this morning. If you're a guest, uh, you may not know, but this is not at all what we usually do. We usually have a contemporary service down the hall in a room that got flooded yesterday, so that was kind of a surprise. But this morning, we get to worship Jesus right in here. And you know, the thing is, we come here every weekend, and our purpose is to worship Jesus. We don't come here for a certain room, we don't come here for a certain style, we don't come here for anything other than to worship Jesus, because he is the king of the whole universe. He's the one who loves you so much that he gave his life for, for me and for you. And so it doesn't matter what room we're in, we get to celebrate him, and I am so excited that we get to do that today. You know, maybe today's a good thing, because maybe it... it slips up our rhythms just a little bit and it gives us maybe a little bit more awareness of who Jesus is and maybe a little more openness for him to move in our lives. So, so I want to pray as, as we begin today that he would do the, just that. Come Holy Spirit, we welcome you in this place. We praise you that we have the opportunity to come and tell you just how good you are, Lord Jesus. We are so thankful that you are the creator, that you are the sustainer of all things, that you are Lord. And so we are here today to lift you up, to lift you high. It's not about us. It's all about you, Jesus. I just pray that you would meet us in this place as we worship you. Lord, we love you and pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Won't you stand and sing with us? So good, you're so good, you're so good, Jesus. We come to bow before you. Let's lift our voices together. Come, let us sing. Sing, come, let us sing. To the Lord, come, let us bow down before Him. His banner is love over us, and His mercies are new.
Let's lift him up today. Praise you, Lord God, in this place. In the highest. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Kim Coleman, one of the members here, and we're so glad that you chose to worship with us, and thank you for finding us in the sanctuary this morning. So if you are a guest, please fill out the Connect card in the row in front of you. Drop it off in the offering <coughs> bin as you exit. Um, you're also welcome to join us for a welcome luncheon on the 23rd and just register on our events page if you choose to join us for that welcome luncheon. We do need everyone to register your attendance, so please sign in with the QR code, the app, or a Connect card. If you are worshiping online with us, please make a comment that you are there so that we can, we can know you're present with us this morning. Start the new year taking the next step in your spiritual walk and developing a profound love for God and others. Our next spiritual growth track class starts next Sunday morning. There is a one-time class at the end for those who desire to become members of our church, and you can find details on our events page. With the new year comes those big credit card bills. Learn how to become debt-free and be able to save and give like never before. Our Dave Ramsey class starts in the next couple of weeks. There are details in the weekly and on our events page of our website. We have a new ministry for young moms in crisis pregnancies called Embrace Grace. And Ashley Wilson is here with us to tell us a little bit more about it. Hey everyone, I'm so excited to share with you about this ministry that we started up uh, last year. It's called Embrace Grace and we run a 12-week support group at Salem Church for uh, moms in crisis pregnancies. So these are moms finding themselves in unexpected pregnancies that are single. Um, and so we're starting another semester this February. We're so excited. We already have a couple girls signed up. And I just want to share a quick testimony about um, the love boxes, which um, you can see up there. These are our main source of outreach. And we make these love boxes for the girls and distribute them to pregnancy centers. And I recently met with a girl who um, got one of these from the pregnancy centers. And in the box is a book um, called A Bump in Life. And it's testimonies 
um, about moms that chose life for their babies even though their circumstances were really hard and how God worked. And this girl told me that when she found out she was pregnant, she felt hopeless, but after she read this book, now she knows that God has a plan for her and her baby. Um, and so that's just one small story of the amazing impact um, that these boxes can have. So on Friday night, I wanted to invite you guys to come out to Salem and help us build these boxes. We have all the materials ready to pack them, put them, pray over them. We're going to be writing letters to put in them um, and distribute them to pregnancy centers. And um, also to hear more about the ministry, we'll be sharing testimonies from past semesters as well as how you can get involved in future semesters. We throw a huge baby shower for these girls at the end of the semester, and we need a lot of help with those. And so um, if you guys are interested in getting involved in a, um, a big way or a small way, um, there's, there's no commitment um, too small. So if you guys want to come out, come out Friday night, just RSVP on the website. My email's on there. Uh, we'd love to see you guys there. Thanks so much. You can give to ministries like Embrace Grace and other ministries in our church. We thank you for your continued and faithful giving. You can drop your offering in the bin at the back. You can donate through our app or through the mail. Let's continue in worship. Hey, can we stand together? Um, we have such a redemptive God, don't we? It just, it's, it's a hard situation, but, I, you know, the world gives us a hard situation and God gives us a special moment together. Isn't that cool? This is such a special moment together where, you know, I don't know, it's just the Spirit of God is here and we're able to come together and y'all showed up, which is amazing. <laughs> yeah. We come to worship no matter what happens. and We can worship anywhere. Praise be to the Lord. His spirit is within us, and we can worship him anywhere. So, God, as we just move forward in this service, continue to make this a special moment for us as a church family. And, God, I just pray that you'd be so praised by us this morning, lavished with praise. Any circumstance is just a circumstance. Um, that's an opportunity to praise you, Lord, for all the things we have for this family we have, this church family. Be lifted high by us. Be glorified. Glory in the highest to you, Lord God. Let your presence fall in this place. Let's sing together.
what do you have for us this morning we yield and submit our lives to you God call us out and we are listening Lord because here we are whatever you have for us Lord we submit to your will this morning amen church we put ourselves below you you are the king on the throne and we just submit ourselves to you Lord today come what may We remain to be children of you, Lord God. And you remain to be good. We just give you every circumstance in the room. You unravel me with a melody. He's singing over us. You surround. 
Come on, of deliverance. Of deliverance from my enemies. No one can come against us. All my fears are gone. I'm no longer saying to fear. Testify, I am a child. Oh, mother's womb you knew me from my mother's womb you have chosen me you call me has called my name and I've been born again into your family flows through my veins going back no I'm I'm no longer a slave to fear sing it out Let 
the king of my heart be the mountain where i run the fountain i drink from oh he is my song let the king of my heart be the shadow where i hide the ransom for my life oh he is my song and you are good Oh, you are good, good. Oh, you are good, good. Oh, you are good, good. Oh, good. Oh, let the key. My heart be the wind inside my sails, the anchor in the waves. Oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins, the echo of my days. Oh, he is my song. Let the king. the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins the echo of my days oh he is my son you are good you're good oh you are good you're good in every trial and every circumstance you are
praise you that no matter what we experience in this life, that you are Lord of all. You are Lord of all creation. You are Lord of our lives. Lord, I just pray that you would meet us in these moments as we study your word, as we come to know you a little more. For your word is truth, and it speaks to our lives. Lord, I pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would help us to come to know you more and more, God. Lord, we love you, and we praise you, and we pray all of this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. You may be seated, friends. Well, whether you're worshiping with us online or here in person, I'm just so honored to get to share God's word with you here today. You know, we've been, we started off uh, last week, Pastor Jonathan got us off to an awesome start in our brand new series called Domino Effect. And in this series, we're talking about the fact, it's kind of an interesting metaphor, that one, if you you stack dominoes next to each other, one domino can knock over another domino that's at least 50% larger than the first one, right? Which doesn't sound all that impressive until you start doing the math on that, and you realize that by the 23rd domino, you could like topple the Eiffel Tower with that thing, okay? It's like the miracle of compound interest, right? If you've heard of that before, it's the same kind of thing, right? That, that simple, ongoing acts of faithfulness can lead to incredibly big results. Simple, ongoing acts of faithfulness can lead to incredible results. And so as we start this new series, or this new year to the, together as a church, we're asking that God would help us all to be able to put some, some habits into place, some simple, ongoing acts of faithfulness uh, that help us to draw closer to Jesus Christ. Uh, now today, we're, uh, of course, we're following the book of Colossians, and that's kind of our, our driving force for this series. And we're going to look at some verses that Paul starts really early on in the book with, and they're verses that are all about Jesus. And so this domino today, if you will, is this domino of who is Jesus Christ in your life? And I know we're only in week two of the series, but we're going big today because this is the biggest, this is the most important truth that I could ever talk about. It's a central truth of who we are as Christians. Uh, It's a central truth of how God has revealed himself to our world. And so I'm, I'm just so excited to get to share with you about it because God chose to reveal himself to us in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the most significant person ever to walk on the face of this earth. And it's kind of funny today that the, the language we're going to read is from a guy from Paul who was initially 100% opposed to Jesus. If you remember his story, he was literally having Christians killed. He was trying to stomp this thing out before Christianity ever even got out of the gates. But Paul was converted. He met Jesus on the road to Damascus. Jesus came and <laughs> knocked him off of his horse, basically. Uh, and, and Paul was, was blinded by, by a bright light. He was confronted by the risen Christ, who said, his name was Saul then, he said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he realized that he was fighting against someone, not someone who had just been crucified and dead, but no, someone who was alive. And someone who is God. He is God. You think about Jesus' impact on this world. We have our calendar is based on Jesus, right? It's based on his birth. Our greatest holidays uh, based on Jesus. Virtually every person in this world has heard the name of Jesus and has some kind of opinion on him. There's more books about him, more talks about him, more thoughts have been given about Jesus Christ than anybody in the history of this world. And yet, he started off born to two pretty normal people, spent his first 30 years on this earth as a carpenter, an average guy. His resume was nothing that would have been that impressive. He, he never wrote a book. He never ran for political office. He never ran a large company or had a bunch of employees. He never had great wealth. His total time of, of uh, outward focus ministry was really around three years. And here we are 2,000 years ago, or years later, and we're still talking about him. We're still talking about him. You cannot underestimate, excuse me, you cannot overestimate 
the impact that Jesus has had here on this, on this world. So there's so much in these passages that I could talk about. Um, I'm going to have to just keep myself moving because there's so much good stuff in here. I'm going to jump right in, in fact, to verse 15 here and highlight just a few things that this, this, these words tell us about Jesus. First, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. It says the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn <laughs> over all creation. Now, this is really wild because we can't physically see God, okay? But we got a, an actual image of God in the person of Jesus Christ. See, when Jesus came down to this earth, uh, from our vantage point, it changed who God is, even though God himself never changes, but it gave us a new look at God because now we got to see God in human form, a God who looks like us. No other faith believes it in the way that we do it, that God literally, he leaves heaven, he comes down to this earth, and he is the invisible, or the image of the invisible God. Now you might say, well, I like to see God in, in nature and puppies and sunrises and golf courses and all that. Yeah, that's fine. We call that general revelation. Like, kind of like a shadow outline of God, if you will. But Jesus is infinitely superior to that, okay? Jesus is this visible image of who God is. He's the visible image of the invisible. So he's very specific revelation. That when we read his words, it's straight from God. When we see his actions, we know exactly how God would act because we saw how God acts. We see that in the, in the scriptures. They help us to understand God. So Jesus, he's this in, image of the invisible God. But second there, you see that he's the firstborn over all creation. Now, what does that mean? Well, when something, in this context, when something is first, it means best. It's kind of like if you are the first chair trumpet in, the, in your band, right? Like that doesn't mean that you were the first trumpet ever to join the band. It means you are the best trumpet in the band, right? You are the leading person there. Jesus is the firstborn. He is the leader. He's number one. He's supreme over all of creation. All of creation. Every, okay, everything that God has made is under the, le the lordship, the leadership of Jesus. But Paul's going to take this a point further in the next verse, verse 16. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or ruler rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Him. Now, this is awesome. You might hear kind of the words of John who said that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That Jesus, when the, the whole thing, Mary and Joseph, born of a virgin, like that's not when Jesus began. That's when he entered earth in human form. Jesus is like eternally existent. He's always been there. And it, it puts him right here at creation. So when you think about creation, and when you look at creation, you're looking at the works of Jesus. That we have in our galaxy, uh, they say at least 100 billion stars. That's like the low end, right? And that's just one galaxy, one kind of moderate-sized galaxy out of, we don't even know how many galaxies out there. Okay, so, so this incredibly huge world that Jesus has created, and we live on one planet here in this world, in one specific space and time, in one city, here at one church, and... God loves you, cares about you. The God who's created seemingly infinite stars and planets and all this stuff out there knows how many hairs are on your head, knows what you're stressed about today, knows that pain that you're carrying, and he cares. He's not a distant God, even though he's all-powerful. He's not an unknowable God. No, he listens when you pray. He receives praise when we sing. He's a God who knows, who cares, who loves, who gets it because he's even walked here. He's the God over all of creation. And there's so much richness in knowing that. 
it, it helps us to know our position better because it says that creation was made by him and for him. You think your life doesn't matter? Friend, you're mistaken. You were made for Jesus. He wants a personal relationship with you. The God of the universe literally cares about you, not just like all humans. God cares about you specifically and directly. No matter what you've messed up or what you haven't accomplished or whatever, God loves you, cares about you, accepts you, forgives you. It's an incredible truth. Beyond that, Jesus is the sustainer of creation. Not just creator, but sustainer. Verse 17, he's before all things, and in him all things hold together. See, there's some folks who think that God like created this world, kind of gave the earth a spin, and went on to other projects, and he's not worried about it anymore. Not true. Jesus is the sustainer of creation. He's holding all things together, and that means he's sustaining you and me as well. Maybe you feel like life is kind of falling apart right now. Turn to Jesus. He's the sustainer. He's the one who wants to hold everything together by his grace, by his mercy, through his forgiveness, through the power of the Holy Spirit working in and through you. This is what our God can and will do. We live in this world and we know that it's been scarred by sin, our sins and the sins of many others. We know that creation is, is groaning under the weight of this sin, that the world we live in, both the natural world and, and, and what we experience in our lives, that it's not what God intended it to be, but he's not done. The Bible promises us that Jesus is coming back someday, that he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth, that there's going to be this restoration of Eden, right, of the way that God wanted it to be in the beginning. And, and so that he's going to wipe away every tear from our eyes, and there's going to be no more sadness, no more pain, no more suffering. We have this hope. He's the creator, he's the sustainer, and someday he's the recreator of everything that there is. That's our Jesus. And so next, Paul tells us that he's the head of the church. The next verse, verse 18, he says, so he's the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning and the firstborn among the dead, so that in everything he may have supremacy. So that first section, he is the head of the church. Now you think about, for us, the head is what gives all the directions. I can, I can talk because my brain turned on today, right? I'm, more, I'm, I'm up, I'm awake, and everything's functioning well. I can move my hand because of what's happening up here. The same is true with the church. We have nothing of value to do outside of Jesus Christ. Hear me, Anderson Hills, <laughs> it's not my church. It's not the staff's church. It is Jesus' church. Always has been always will be. I could get hit by the bus today. This church would be fine because it's Jesus' church, not mine, not ours. It's his. It's his. He is the head of the church. So <laughs> when we seek to, to guide the church, to direct the church, we're always starting with Scripture saying, Jesus, what are you calling us to? Well, what is it that you're calling us to in this season? Because we want to be faithful to your leadership because you are the head, not us. You are the head of the church. And then in that next phrase, I love this, it's so powerful. It says he's the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead so that in everything he might have supremacy. Now, this is kind of an odd way to say, you say, firstborn among the dead, from, excuse me, from among the dead, that from is key. What does that mean? Well, it means he's alive, that he's risen from the dead. In fact, we, we say it on Easter, right? I say, he is risen, and you say, let's try that again, he is risen. Amen. It's true. It's always true. It's not just a, I can't stay in here. It's not just an Easter story, man. It's an everyday story. You've got to understand this, that the truth of the resurrection is not just an Easter thing. It's not a one time a year kind of thing. It's something that is so true every single day of our life that Jesus is risen from the dead, that he's conquered sin, that he's conquered death. And so there's hope that, that, that all the pains and the problems and the suffering and whatnot of this world, that Jesus has come and he's conquered, he's victorious, he is alive and he's risen from the dead. 
And so we don't celebrate that once a year. We celebrate that every single day of the year. That he is true, he is real, he is alive, and he wants to change your life. He wants to change your heart. That he is reigning over all creation because he conquered death. I don't know what problems you've got in life. I know they're real, but you're still alive. And so that means there's still hope because Jesus, he is alive too and he's working in and through you. And for the follower of Jesus, we don't even have to fear death because he's victorious over that. Even death, even death, the worst thing this world can imagine, can't stop, can't hold back the follower of Jesus. That's exciting, and that's why, that's why we get so pumped up about Easter, but it's really, truth is, it's an it's a everyday kind of reality in our lives. Jesus is alive, and we don't get tired of the story because it's the best news in the world. I mean, every day, Jennifer and I, we say to each other, I love you, and you know what? Never once has she said that to me, and I said, you told me that yesterday. Tell me something new. No, I love to hear that because I'm glad it's still true. It's life-changing. It's central in my life. Her love is central in my life, and, and it's such good news. And so is the fact that Jesus is alive. We never tire of this message because it's so good. Jesus has conquered the grave. No other faith out there. No other faith out there does that. No other faith out there teaches that. You can go to the tomb of Muhammad. You can go to the tomb of Buddha. They're still there. Not Jesus. It's empty. It's empty because he's alive, because he's risen, because he is real and powerful in our lives. And so that leads us to number seven, that Jesus is 100% God. Verse 19, God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. Uh, this is so important, okay, that, that all the fullness of God dwells in Jesus. That means he's not just a good guy, an interesting teacher, a good moral authority. Yeah, he was all of that, but that is just the beginning. He is God. All the fullness of God dwells in him. He is God. Some people have confused it, and they looked at Jesus, and they said, well, he was a great teacher with some really, really earth-shattering kind of ideas, and, and we should all learn from his teachings. Nope, that's not it. He is God. His teachings are incredible because he is God. His actions are incredible because he is God. Jesus is incredible because he is God. See, Jesus didn't give us, when, when you look at the life of Jesus, he didn't give us a whole lot of option here because he came and he proclaimed that he is God. So by saying that, it means he either is or he's crazy and we should ignore him altogether. There's your alternatives there or else he's lying, right? That there have been lots of people who've come and have said they're God and the thing is, that's a pretty easy one to disprove, you know? There's a whole lot of folks who have said it, and we look at them all as crazy. You've got the, the David Koresh's, the Charles Manson's, the, all, every generation has some of them that believe there's some form of God. Jesus is different. He's different. Because, see, here's the thing about Jesus. It's from both Christian and non-Christian sources alike it's very well supported that Jesus not only lived, but that he died on a cross at the hands of the Romans per the will of the Jewish authorities. It's extremely well established historical fact. So why? Why does a Jewish carpenter get crucified? Well, the Bible's really clear about it. John 5, 18, for this reason, they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Jesus did a lot of incredible things. Jesus walked on water. They didn't kill him for it. He, ra he, he fed 5,000. They didn't kill him for that. He raised Lazarus from the dead. They didn't kill him for that. No. They killed him because he claimed to be God. And they looked at that and they said, 
this is blasphemy. He made these big, incredible statements. John 8, 58, he said, before, <laughs> before Abraham was born, I am. Remember those words when Moses stood at the burning bush and said, God, who am I to tell Pharaoh sent me? Who, what's your name? And he said, I am. Jesus puts himself right here in position. He's the God of Moses. He's the God of Abraham. He's the same God. He's the creator. He, this is who he is. He said it at his own trial when he knew what was going to happen. Verse 14 of Matthew, or chapter 14 of Matthew, it says, The high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, Jesus said. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming in the clouds of heaven. Son of Man. You recognize those words? They're from Daniel, from the Messianic prophecies uh, about who God was going to send, who would be this, <coughs> this Savior of all the people of Israel. And Jesus is saying, that's me. You've read about the Son of Man. He's standing right here before you. And when the high priest heard that, he tears his clothes. He says, we've heard enough. He deserves to die. Jesus was crucified because he claimed to be God. And then follower after follower after follower of his was violently martyred because they believed it, because they saw it firsthand. What did they see? A resurrected Jesus. And if you're not God, you can't just get out of the tomb and go for a walk. It doesn't work that way. They realized that he is who he says he is. He's the fullness of God. But it's more, and you might say, okay, that's great, that's factual, I understand that, but, but what about me? How does this impact me? Well, that's the next thing Paul talks about, verse 20, that he's the reconciler. And through him, Jesus, to reconcile to God's self all things, whether things on heaven, or things, excuse me, things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on a cross. Verse 21, once you were alienated from God, and were enemies in your minds because of evil behavior. But now, he's reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. That's you. That's you. When God looks at you, that's what God sees. You may look at you and you may see disappointment, you may see a failure, you may see sin after sin after sin after sin. When God looks at you, God sees God's own righteousness. God sees the beauty of his son given for you. That's what God sees when God looks at you. So you can be reconciled. You can be right with God. You can have your sins forgiven. That when God looks at you, he looks down and he says, yeah, John messed up again. What are we gonna do about it? And Jesus, our advocate in heaven, he says, I got this one. Yeah, he messes up a lot, let me tell you. But he said yes to me. And so John owes this amazingly large debt and I paid it all because John could never pay that. And so he is forgiven because of what I've done, not because of what he's done. That's Jesus' truth about you. You know, I feel like we, we, we need to spend some time in prayer, and, and Brad's gonna come and he's gonna lead us in, in a time of just kind of reflection and prayer of how good Jesus is and what a difference Jesus has made in our lives. And so I just invite you, whether here in the sanctuary or whether at home, just to take, take a couple moments and, and take a few minutes here with us and give yourself to Jesus as we pray. Hi, I'm Brad Durflinger, and I'll be leading us in prayer this morning to hear what the God of all creation, the God of the universe, has to say to each of us personally. And at this time, I encourage you to relax. Go ahead and close your eyes. Quiet your mind as we welcome the Holy Spirit into this room, into our hearts and as we come into the Lord's presence. Lord, we praise you for your goodness. 
for your mercy. We praise you that we, you created everything and are sovereign. With your eyes still closed, I invite you to remember the ways in which God has blessed you, how he's provided for you, how he's been good to you. Still relaxing. <clears throat> now I invite you into a time of reflection and asking for forgiveness to recall where you've fallen short in following Jesus. Maybe for not trusting him. For not honoring him as Lord. for believing the lies of the enemy. Ask God if there's anything blocking you from submitting to his will or his authority and what those obstacles might be. Now, as you think about those things, go ahead and release them to Jesus and ask for forgiveness for any shortfall that might be on your mind. Go ahead and do that now. Friend, you are forgiven. Now that we've released all of these things that have kept us from God, from fully enjoying his presence, ask the Holy Spirit to help you receive the Holy Spirit and ask to surrender to his authority. Ask the Holy Spirit to help build faith and trust. To persevere. And now, Father God, we thank you for your presence this morning. We thank you for any words given here. And be before we step back in, just know that God wants you to have hope, that he loves you, that he has good things prepared for you, that you are forgiven, that he sent his Holy Spirit to help you. And go ahead and open your eyes. And may you know, and I bless you, that God would continue to bless you and draw you closer so you may know him better. Let's surrender together. We fall down. We lay our crown. At the feet of Jesus, the greatness of His mercy and love. At the feet of Jesus, and we 
you could see Jesus today, you wouldn't see a peasant from Galilee. You'd see a king on the throne, surrounded by angels who sing that exact thing day and night. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. Because it's who he is. He's the Lord. So as we get ready to go today, I got one more thing for you. I challenge you this week to kind of put it into practice in in this way, that you'd say, okay, if Jesus is my Lord, what do I do about it? Well, real tangibly, keep track of how you act in ways that reflect that Jesus is Lord in your life and when you don't, because we all have those moments where we don't. You might, maybe in the morning, you want to get up and, and say, Jesus, you're Lord. I want to follow you each and every step today. Would you help me to do that? I want you to be the leader. I want you to be the Lord before my feet hit the floor. I want to decide that. And maybe in the evening reflect and say, Jesus, how's, how did I follow you today? Thank you for giving me the strength. And how did I fall short? I want to confess those things to you. Because by the power of the Holy Spirit, God will help us to continue to put Jesus on the throne right where he belongs in the way that we live each and every day of our lives. So would you stand with me as we prepare to go, as we go out into this world that needs to know that Jesus is Lord and so there's hope. We're gonna go out and we're gonna take that hope and that joy and that peace. We're gonna go out in the strong name of Jesus. We're gonna go in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
See you.